Restore my faith, God my rock and God my hope, you will prevail. You're the constant in a sea of change. What you've done and what you said will never fade. What you've done and what you said will never fade. Thank you so much. The book of 1 John can generally be divided into two sections. When you look at the themes that are presented in majority in the first few chapters and then again in the second few chapters, you'll find the first two chapters are dealing with the theme of fellowship. And then the last half of the book is dealing with the theme of love. And in the first two chapters of 1 John, we have seen the importance of fellowshipping in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, and that is also referred to as walking in the light. For example, in verse 5 of chapter 1, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, 
and in him is no darkness at all. And then we saw just a few days ago how that God has given us an unction. Uh, God has given us the presence of His Holy Spirit. And so when it comes to walking in the light, walking with the Spirit, these are themes relative to the subject of our fellowship in the Lord, in the light of God. The second half of the book deals with our sonship relationship with God or His love for us. For example, chapter 4 and verse 8 will tell us, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now you and I are children of God. We are in the family of God because of the amazing love of God. And so when you read 1 John, you see that our fellowship is based on the attribute of the light of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, but our relationship is because of the love of God. And so fellowship and love are themes that we find commonly in the first and second portions of First John. Now tonight we have the privilege of seeing that God loves us so much that He's coming back to take us home. What kind of a father would forget his children? How many of you are glad that we serve a God who never forgets his promises? And this is the kind of love we have the privilege of studying. And I hope you consider it, as I do tonight, a great privilege to open God's Word. I want you to see that the love of God for the believer is a realized love. It is not something that we seek or hope for. It is something that we experience and know. It is something that is known to us by the Word, by the presence of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in verse 1 we read, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. The word behold obviously means observe this. Pay attention to this. And I love it when in the Scriptures we find what I would say is a double emphasis because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But we read, for example, in 1 Timothy where the Bible says, The Spirit speaketh expressly. It's, a, it's an emphasized phrase. And here is the word, Behold. And the Holy Spirit, if I may take the liberty to say, shifting gears. And now we're moving from one great subject to another. And the great subject last week was the unction of the Holy Spirit. But now, behold, we're going to learn about the love of God. Now, this realized love is a bestowed love. And the Bible says here, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Now, folks, one of the great mistakes we can make in the Christian life is to believe the lie of the devil that we are not fully accepted in the Beloved. So many people as Christians struggle with the terms self-worth or self-esteem or acceptance. But would you ponder would you hear the behold tonight? What manner of love God has bestowed upon you. But I've had an abortion. But I've lost my purity. But I've, and you fill in the blank. And I would answer you from the scripture. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon you. It is a love that is truly amazing. The word manner speaks of the sort or the quality of love. This manner is describing for us, this term, the quality of love that God has had for us for all of eternity. He has bestowed and known us and bestowed His love upon us. It is here what manner or how great this phrase occurs only seven times in the Bible. What manner of love, this great, special kind of love. This is not uh, a verse or a phrase that is commonly then seen in the Scripture. In the New Testament, it is given to us rather seven times. John is saying here, he is astonished and he is amazed by the love. Now let's just stop and think about it. Think about when you got saved. Think about how old you were. Or what you could have offered to God. Or if you were saved later in life, 
the sin, perhaps, and the tragedy and the difficulty you'd experience. I think every one of us would say, I had nothing to offer God. I could not have purchased my way into heaven. And yet God loved me. Can we just stop right now and be thankful for that? What manner of love has the Father bestowed upon us? We see the manner of love. It's describing a quality or a sort that is just amazing. And then we see the bestowment, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed. Uh, this is to give something to someone of one's own accord. Uh, the bestowal of a gift. And this verb is in the perfect tense. It shows us that this bestowal is for once and for always. It's something that God is not going to give and then take away. Right? You remember the illustration years ago of the, uh, of the comic strip of the guy walking along with the daisy and, and he was trying to know if his girlfriend loved him. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. And sometimes in life we have those insecurities. <laughs> All of us have those insecurities. And in relationships sometimes those insecurities come. Isn't it amazing that God says, I don't ever want you to wonder or feel insecure about my love. It is an everlasting love. It's the Heavenly Father that is freely giving this love. Notice here in chapter 4 and verse 9, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and that He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God is the prime mover in salvation. We love Him because He first loved us. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. And can you think of it tonight? That there are boys and girls in the uttermost parts of this earth living in, in, in amazing poverty perhaps and with brokenness and wondering uh, uh, about their future. And from this church is a missionary sent with a singular message. And the message is that God loves you and Jesus died for you. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. This love, when properly understood and appreciated, is the proper motivation for serving the Lord Jesus Christ. When you are aware of this love, engulfed in it, when you are grateful for it, church is not a drudgery. Teaching the class is not a drudgery. It is the outflow of a heart that recognizes I was unworthy, I was undone, I was undeserving, and God bestowed His love upon me. What can I render for all of these benefits, God, that you have bestowed upon me? It's always sad to see a Christian who feels that they must do what they do merely from duty. There's a measure of duty in all of life. I'm sorry to tell you that. Tomorrow morning most of you will get up and do your work and some of you will do a military weekend once in a while and there's a lot of duty in life. I get that. But the fundamental motivation for the mature Christian is not duty. Yes, the Bible speaks of the Christian life as being in a spiritual army or being a soldier and fighting the good fight of faith. I understand that. But would you turn in your Bible, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because there is a higher motivation than duty. And it is relative to this bestowal of love. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Would you say that, please? For the love... Now, folks... When Paul the Apostle explained his ministry, the motivation for his ministry, he described this love of Christ. He never lost what is referred to in the book of the Revelation as his first love. I remember Dr. Hudson being here years ago, and he said, Brother Chapel, your people are in their first love stage. Folks, can I admonish tonight? Let's not forget that first love. 
You can't pastor a place for 35 years without seeing people that, that go for a while or maybe a little longer and, and some that quit and some that get discouraged and some that uh, change positions or find a pragmatic way of accommodating style of theology so that they can justify doing something different or nothing at all. But for someone to faithfully love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ their whole life, how many of you would say, that's a goal of my life, and it's a challenge when I see that. Amen. Dr. Sis texted me this morning. <laughs> Pastor, I miss my home church. I want you to know I'm praying for you. I love you. I'll be preaching today in Mississippi. Dr. Don Sisk, physically speaking, Dr. Don Sisk, from the standpoint of what he might need physically, does not need to preach another message in his life. He could sit down in an easy chair, he could watch his Kentucky basketball, he could do whatever in the world he wanted to do. Why? After already clocking four million miles on Delta Airlines, would he ever climb on a plane again? folks? after just the first few flights, it's not that much fun anymore. Why would he get on another flight, go to another city, stay in another hotel? Why would he keep going and going and going? And I submit to you, there is one fundamental reason that men and women of God continue. And it is that they never get over the love of God. It is the love of Christ that constraineth us. And I can tell you that in my life, when there have been seasons when I, I lost a will or I became spiritually tired, it was often because I did not take enough time to just say, Step back and revel and behold what manner of love the Father. I'll tell you, there's hardly a trial in life that a look at the cross won't help you solve. Oh, it's got to gotta go drive the bus. Wait a minute. Look at the cross. And behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed. Now look at this, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge... That if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now here's what's so great about this love. I was spiritually dead, and I was in darkness, and I, I had nothing to offer. But he still loved me and died for me, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. When you really get a hold of the love of God, your goal is not to live for self. Your goal is to live for the one Amen. with such amazing love. Amen. The bestowal of love. It's a bestowed love. It's not a love that uh, is earned. We know that salvation is the gift of grace, but may I say to you tonight that the love of God is a gift of grace too. Yes, he bestows His love. It's a bestowed love. But I want you to notice, secondly, it's a belonging love. A belonging love. Notice what the Bible says here in verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. So it's not just that for God so loved the whole world. It's that God loves you and He calls you a son or a daughter of Himself. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called, that is, uh, to be named, uh, to receive a name. And the name given to us by God is that we are the sons of God. The daughters of God. I, I received a call very late last night from a dear friend, a man that I led to Christ maybe 40 years ago. And uh, he was describing an illness, his son's at Scripps Clinic in La Jolla, not sure if he's going to make it. He described the medical prognosis. And then he just said, as you know, Brother Chapel, it's hard to watch a child suffer. Please pray for my son. His name's Steve, Steve Carrillo. I've been praying for his son. If we could love our children with this kind of love, how much more does the Father in heaven love you? That he would bestow 
Some might say, well, man, I think it'd be great if the queen would knight me, you know. Oh, that'd be awesome if the president would give me the Medal of Honor. Me and <laughs> Maria Nav- Navratilova both have it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> It'd be so great to have a bestowal of honor. Wait a minute. You have, every one of you that are saved, been bestowed by God yes, as his son Amen. or his daughter. Why then do we seek affirmation in so many ways from so many places? Why so many young people give away that which they should not give away in their dating time to find the acceptance of someone when you have such acceptance from an almighty God? The ramifications of this sonship are astounding. We are now a part of God's family. We are the joint heirs of God, Romans 8, verse 17. We receive an inheritance from God, Ephesians 1, and verses 18 and 19. The eyes of our understanding are enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope that is of His calling, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance is in the saints. We have a new position in Christ. We are seated in the heavenlies. We have a heavenly home awaiting for us. We are accepted as His Son. And I'd like you to turn to this one, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. The ramifications of being a child of God. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. It's not just that He forgives us. It's not just that He gives us an eternal destination, the hope of heaven, or the ministry and the person of the Holy Spirit. But He gives us a wonderful position as His Son. He identifies with us as His Son. And sometimes we're embarrassed of Him, and maybe we don't pray, and maybe we don't witness as we should, but He is never that way toward you. Notice in Ephesians 1 verse 5, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. In other words, it was God's predetermined will that those who are the saved would be adopted unto himself as a son or as a daughter according to the good pleasure of his will. He finds pleasure in his family. He finds pleasure in this relationship. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Let's read that verse number 6 together. Ready, begin. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Behold what manner of love has been bestowed upon you. He says here, you are accepted in the beloved. You have my acceptance. You don't need to seek it uh, in a bottle or a pill or with the wrong crowd or from someone whose attention you want. Uh, If you get passed over or you didn't get the autograph or you didn't get the job or whatever it was that you wanted, always remember that you can stand comfortably, peaceably, and hopefully knowing that you have already been accepted and loved by God and made his son or his daughter. You have a position in the family of God. And when you see, and I, I, for example, I highly respect the Queen of England and the royal family. And I think the Queen in particular is perhaps one of the most outstanding women to ever live and very possibly a believer. But when you see uh, the, the tremendous position and accolades and, and the seats of royalty, we ought never, ever to be jealous of anything on this earth which is but temporal. When we are already at this moment seated in the heavenlies. That is a kind of acceptance the world can never give. We are identified as sons. We are thankful for our children. But think of the fact that God is thankful for you. But this is often misunderstood by the world. We are identified as the sons and daughters of God, and we are blessed, and we should be constantly grateful and motivated by this. But notice what it says in verse 1. Therefore the world knoweth us not. The unsaved man cannot understand this intimate personal relationship we have with the Lord. They don't understand it. They don't perceive it. They don't recognize it. It is not surprising then that the world does not know 
the nature of the relationship between God and His children because the world does not know Him. It is only in the understanding of the nature of God and the person of God and the experience of the salvation of God that we can say gladly, I'm a child of God. I don't know who it was, maybe that great Baptist songwriter Gloria Gaither who wrote the song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Remember that song? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. What does the next verse say? Washed in the fountain, right? Cleansed by His blood. Join heirs with Jesus as I travel earth's sod. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. You see, when you're saved, you have a relationship and you behold and, and some of you haven't been beholding it enough lately. You're too busy beholding him or her or this or that. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon you. You say, but, but pastor, you don't understand. It seems like, uh, you know, people don't like me for the way I am. Or I, I, have, I, I don't feel accepted because of, of my color, my race, my station in life, my position at the factory. Listen, you may find that there is discrimination in this world. But there is only acceptance from your heavenly Father. Behold what manner of love the Father hath given to us. But the world does not know us because the world does not know Him. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 4 says, They think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. They're like, why does he always go to church like that? Why doesn't he knock down some cold ones with us and listen to the dirty jokes like the rest of the boys? Hey, we're going TDY with the military. We're going to have a good time at such and so city. This is the idea of the world. And the Bible is very clear in 1 Peter 4 and verse 4. They think that it's strange when you're not participating with them. But if you have a close walk with God and you're amazed at His love, your spirit would be, why would I want to listen to their dirty jokes when I can be with God or His people? I just need you to know tonight that if you intend to walk with God, there will be times in this life when people think that you're just a little weird. Yes, sir. Amen. Now, I understand. Some of us are a little weird without even trying. I get that. <laughs> but in the sense of walking with the Lord, the world's not going to understand that. They didn't understand Noah when he was saying, It's going to flood, the rain is coming. Right. What's rain anyways? Here he comes, that crazy preacher preaching judgment. Says he knows God. Says he got a word from God. The world will think you strange for being in church tonight. And most of Christendom thinks you strange because most of them are involved in a worldly type church. The world thinks this strange. But for those of us who are saved, we are beholding this love that has been bestowed. And we are still amazed. I am still amazed that I am called the Son of God. Listen, that's much, much greater than being called a pastor or a boss or a president or a, or a sergeant or a colonel or whatever title you want to choose in this life. There's no greater privilege than being a son of God or a daughter of God. And so we see that there's a realized love. Do you realize that love? I, I'm not going to try to be a therapist here. <laughs> but if we had just a moment, could you not just take a moment to just reflect on the fact that God can't love you, would not love you any more than He does right now. He has loved you since the beginning of time. You can't earn any more of His love. He has already bestowed it all on you. He's given it to you. It's in the present tense. It's yours. It's yours to be grateful for and to enjoy. 
Stop trying to find acceptance in the wrong kinds of relationships and be thankful that you have it in the one and only relationship that really matters. We see a realized love. Then we see, secondly tonight, a returning Lord. Verse 2. Beloved, now are we called, now are we the sons of God. There's something about this switching to chapter 3 that is is interesting to me. How many of you have recognized in chapters 1 and 2 it was my little children, my children, my children, my children. Now it's beloved. You are called the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now we notice in this verse that there is an anticipated potential for change, and it says, now are we the sons of God. We've established that as well in verse 1. But notice this phrase, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We are currently residing in a suit of flesh, this body, the flesh. We have an eternal soul. We have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But we stand here as the sons of God, saved, set apart. But there's an ultimate redemption that is spoken of here. There is an anticipated potential. Our current place Presently, we are called the sons of God. That status does not change when we see Christ and go to heaven. We are the eternal sons of God through salvation. But there will be change. It doth not yet appear at this very moment what it's going to ultimately be like. Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. How many of you are glad God's not finished with you, by the way, right now? Romans 8 and 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Most of us are not where we should be yet in that conforming. We're in a process. But when we see him, we will be like him. We will know him as he is. So it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Our current standing is that we are redeemed. We are the sons of God living in a fleshly tabernacle. But our future hope has yet to be realized. This is why heaven is so attractive for believers because there we will not only see the Lord Jesus Christ, but we will be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I've heard some Pentecostal preachers heretically preach that we are already in every way like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's heresy. We are not yet what we shall be. There's an anticipated potential. In all of us, when we think about this bestowal of God's love and, and that we're the sons of God, we always need to remember not only do we find acceptance and joy in, in what He's given us now and the, the, the placement of sons and daughters, but we also need to be anticipating what it's going to be like because now we see through a glass darkly, but then, face to face, what a day that will be. It will become an actualized fulfillment. This anticipated potential will become an actualized fulfillment. Now notice that in verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now, this fulfillment that I'm speaking to you about, when we will be changed, uh, when, when we will leave off this corruptible and put on the incorruptible, this fulfillment will be known when we meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we see here, the Bible speaks of it in verse 2, uh, in this way, we know that when He shall appear, uh, this is to make manifest or to make visible or to be realized. And I believe this appearance directly references the rapture of the church, the catching away of the bride of Christ. And when we will be caught away with Him, that at that moment there will be uh, a glorified body for those who have preceded us in death. And that we will be changed instantaneously if we are alive at the time of the rapture. And we will not only be with Him, but we will be like Him. I'm telling you, no corruption. I'm telling you, no toothaches, no cancer. I'm telling you, no boo-boos, no uh-ohs. I'm telling you, it doth not yet appear what we're going to be like. But folks, it is going to be awesome when Jesus Christ appears. 
In fact, if you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, just, just to refresh, because it's good to think about heaven, and it's good to anticipate seeing Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You can study this entire passage sometime if you like, but just to give you the, the, the essence of this appearing, the Bible says in verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You say, but I thought to be absent with the body to be present with the Lord. And there is. I believe there is a consciousness in heaven. I believe that there's a great cloud of witnesses. I believe that our soul is immediately with God and that there's understanding and knowledge and, and, and joy in the presence of God. But there will be at this moment of the rapture a rising of the dead in Christ with their new body. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And so the fulfillment is is to begin at the moment of his appearance and at his appearance we will experience our glorification now what will happen when we see Jesus in short we will be like him turn if you would to 1st Corinthians chapter 15 1st Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50 1st Corinthians 15 when we are raptured and no one is raptured that has not put their faith in Jesus Christ. When we are raptured and we are to see Him and we are with Him, we will be like Him. It is our ultimate glorification. We are now the sons of God. We will then be the sons of God. But we will be changed into His image completely and finally at that time. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that the that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Be behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That's our theme verse for the nursery ministry, these folks that were here just a moment ago. In other words, not everyone's going to die, but everyone, whether those have died before or those who are caught up in the rapture, will be changed. Speaking of this incorruptible, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. In other words, when Christ comes, when we see Him. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. They were, listen, they were buried in corruption. They were buried corruptibly. They will be raised in incorruption. How many of you can say amen to that? Sometimes people talk about the restrictiveness and the controlling government during COVID and, and they push back on things. And I totally get all that. It's, it's, been, it's been so many mixed signals. But as the pastor of this church, I have either presided in or have directed the presiding of six funerals during COVID. And every one of those members were buried in a physical moment of corruption. They're with the Lord, their soul's with the Lord, but their body is corruptible. But when the Lord Jesus appears, they will be raised in incorruption. A perfect body. No COVID, no cancer, no heart problems. They will be raised incorruptibly and they will be changed verse 53 for this corruptible that that you have and that I have as the sons and daughters of God this corruptible this flesh must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so it, it teaches us that when he shall appear we will be like him that we will take on his form so verse 54 when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? How many of you are thankful tonight that this matter of death has no ultimate victory over the child of God? Because not only will, be, will we be raised up, but we will be raised up in incorruption to live eternally as the son or daughter of God. Turn to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20. I know this interests you and it should. Many of you have said goodbye to Christian loved ones. 
Many of you are praying for lost friends to be saved. Why is that so important? Because without Christ, there is no hope of an incorruptible resurrection. Philippians 3.20 For our conversation, speaking of our life, our lifestyle, our hopes and thoughts, our conversation is in heaven. From whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to preach a 10-week series starting on Easter Sunday morning about understanding the times, signs of the times, geopolitical changes, and, and the birth of Israel, and the ramifications of that, and, and uh, Russia and Iran, and their heart towards Israel in the last days. And we're going to talk about some of these different signs, but I want you to understand that we are not necessarily looking for the Antichrist, or the changing of the governments, or the one world currency, or the mark of the beast. What we are looking for is the coming of Jesus Christ himself. Himself. That's the hope of the believer. And it could happen any moment. We are to be looking for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice this, as sons and daughters of God, what will happen when we see Him. Who shall change our vile body. That is to say, say that we are alive at the moment that Jesus comes again. How many of you would love that? You should. You should love the thought of that. At that moment, our vile body will be changed, that it may be fashioned like unto, watch it, His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. Now, these glorious bodies, His resurrected body, it will have a physical appearance. It will be different in the molecular sense. It will be perfect. It will be, perhaps, as we might call it, flesh and bone. But it will not be in the corruptible sense that we currently experience. Again, let's go to the scriptures to try to understand what this body is like. Turn, if you would, to Luke 24, because I know you're interested in this. Luke 24 and verse 38. Luke 24, 38. This is a picture of the resurrected body of Jesus Christ, the kind of body that we will have when we see him. And the Bible says here in Luke 24, 38, and he said unto them, why are ye troubled? And why do, why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Boy, they must have been Baptists. <laughs> Jesus says, behold, my hands and my feet that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have it is a physical body no longer corrupting no longer decaying it is eternal but it is physical it is physical yet immortal. It will never grow old. It will never age. It will never decay. It will never die. It will never spend a day in ICU or the emergency room or in the back of an ambulance. It is eternal. It is immortal. It is incorruptible. It will never have COVID-19. It will never get a disease. It will never have the flu. It will never have a cold. You'll never spend the night with a crying baby in heaven. Why? Because there will be no sickness and no sin in heaven and there will be no corruption in heaven. Your body will be an incorruptible corruptible body. Amen. And frankly, there are hundreds of members of this church that are with the Lord and that will receive this body, people that we have watched suffer in pain, who are no longer in pain, and who for all of eternity will, I believe, enjoy aspects of heaven that we are yet to discover. I believe they'll see rivers, and I believe they'll see the Son of God, and they'll enjoy the fellowship of the saints for all of eternity in this resurrected body. Fanny Crosby wrote many hymns, and she became blind, as you know, as a very young child. She was once asked if she regretted having been blind most of her life, to which she said no. She said, that is why I look forward to the day of the rapture, because the first thing I will get to see from my new body with my new eyes is the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of so many things tonight. 
I think of Brother Ron Chow somewhere in this auditorium. About 7 o'clock this morning, I saw him pulling in. He lives in Beverly Hills for eight years, every single Sunday, fighting MS. He gets up. He gets into his wheelchair. And that's not an easy thing. He gets somehow out of his home, gets into his car, drives up to this church. with his trumpet that he played in the orchestra tonight, with his things, just smiling away. Hey, Pastor, hey, can I help? Yeah, all right, sure. We came in here this morning. For eight years battling this disease, he has found his way to Lancaster Baptist Church with a smile because he knows who his father is and he knows what kind of love has been bestowed upon him and 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 the love of Christ just kinda constrains him to find a church that he believes is doctrinally correct and that has a passion for souls and and it's just in him and it's on him and it's all over him and, and he hasn't let church become a drudgery it's still a delight don't let God's house become a drudgery and that dear brother when that that trumpet sounds, not his trumpet, but that trumpet sounds. Is going to look in the face of Jesus Christ with a completely whole body. I have not seen and ear hath not heard the things that have been prepared for us. It is a realized love. I want to bestow this upon you. Greater than knighthood. Greater than the presidential award, greater than the Purple Heart, God says, I want to bestow upon you a familiar relationship. You're my son. You're my daughter. This realized love is given by a returning Lord who will not only love us now and in saving us on this earth, but lovingly will give to us an incorruptible body that we will use in our worship of Him for all of eternity. And that leads us to this final thought, that since there is a realized love, and because there is a returning Lord, then there must be a ready church. Amen. Yes, sir. We must be ready and readying for when Jesus comes. Yes, sir. Now look at this verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him, now, don't answer me audibly. Just let this sink in. Is it in you? I mean, if, if a preacher can get up and preach about seeing Jesus, putting off the, incorrupt, the, the corruptible and putting on the incorruptible, and living in eternity for heaven, and if I can preach for these last 15 minutes about that hope, then let me ask you, frankly, does that hope live in you? Because that's the only hope that will look at. I don't care if it's the Democrats or the Republicans talking about hope. They don't have any hope. Most of them have been married multiple times and failed in their relationships and failed in their finances and failed in their morality. And many of them are liars and cheats. They can't give you what they don't have. There, there's no hope in that. But there is hope in a coming Lord. Amen. So, a ready church. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Now notice this motivation of hope. John says, this love constrains us, Paul says. But John says, this hope should constrain us. The older you get... The more you stay in the Word, the more you realize that what really, really matters is that one day you're going to see Him. That's what you hope for. Now there's a lot of things that God does in between time and to see the birth of a child, to see the Grand Canyon, to see a friend get saved, 
to see and to be a part of an offering like last Sunday that very few churches in all of America participated in and to see even just driving on this campus what God has done and to see the buses go out today and on and on and on we can all say that there are many things that ha we have hoped for and we have seen with our own eyes and it's been wonderful but none, none of it compares to the hope that we should feel when we think about the fact we're going to see Jesus someday again. And the church has become lulled into being more excited about something at the church or something at the ball field or some kind of a thing in the world and, and some, some kind of an experience that sometimes the thought of Christ coming again is not bringing the hope that it should be. And he says, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. This hope. This past November, a few months ago, there was a radio station in France that accidentally broadcasted the obituaries of 100 well-known people. Just suddenly, they started saying, we regret to inform you, Queen Elizabeth has died. Queen Elizabeth was born, Queen Elizabeth did, da, da, da. next one, Clint Eastwood. We regret to say, Clint Eastwood. They just went through, Pele, they just went through. Over 100, somehow the radio station, over 100 obituaries played. People begin to call in. What are you saying about that all these people really die? How could they die all on the same day? The management ran to the station. People began to try to figure out. They got on the, they got on the airwaves and they said, we, re we regret and we apologize. We're so sorry. But our misfiled new computer system accidentally broadcasted our pre-written obituaries. Now the idea of an obituary being crafted before you die, doesn't that seem just a little awkward? <laughs> but it is a not so subtle reminder that it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. Yes, sir. Right. We had better make sure that our hope is in the coming or the meeting of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see here the motive of our hope is His coming. But now I want you to see as we close tonight the action of our hope. Love and hope should spur us on. Love and hope should cause us to live differently. If I love the Lord and I hope for His return, then the way that I live will be affected. Years ago, uh, I was, I think it was my first Sunday in the, in the ministry, maybe second, I can't remember, Terry I'm sure remembers. And I wanted to win people to the Lord and bring people to the church and all this type of thing. So I met a couple. They were brand new, they moved in the area, and they were from Alaska. Their names were the Matthews. And, and I was talking to them and just, boom, I said, why don't you guys come over to our house for lunch today? I think I was 21. And I just, you know, I just knew when I was a kid growing up, I mean, every Sunday my mom had a spread out there. Just food was there and just people came over and that's just how it worked. And I'm just a newlywed in the ministry. So I just said, hey, why don't you come over to our house? Because I'm sure. <laughs> so I went around the corner. We had, I think, just Danielle maybe at that time. And, and I, I said, um, hey, honey. We're going to have some company today. Doing the Lord's work. I don't even know how to describe the look on Terry's face. It was somewhere between, you're the dumbest man I've ever known, and I'm about to read your obituary on the radio. It was about right in there somewhere. She started to cry. I said, what's wrong? We just go, pull it out, put it on. I think we made $9,000 that first year. She said, honey, we don't have anything to pull out and put on. I said, well, what are we going to do? I said, oh, oh. Let's go to 7-Eleven. They got stuff. True story. We went to 7-Eleven. Honey, I want to tell the story right. How many of you, your wives, help you know the exact story after you told the story? Anybody else? 
Was it hot dogs? No. Macaroni and cheese? Macaroni and cheese. We bought some macaroni and cheese. Probably, probably something else. Bread. I don't know. And when, when, when I saw the tears, I had enough sense to run back to the Matthews and say, don't come over for 30 minutes. Okay, we'll see you then. We went back. <laughs> we went to 7-Eleven. We got it. We talked to the Matthews. They joined the church that night. And then after church, Terry talked to me. <laughs> and, and she was pretty gentle, really. <laughs> she said, now, let me just explain this to you, how this works. She said, when we're going to have people come over to our house, this is something that the wife needs to know about ahead of time. So that we can, so that we can be ready. She said, because I, I, I like to know, she said, preferably a few days, but even a day. But I need to know. And, and now for 40 years, you know, I, I finally get it. I really do. And sometimes I even help with it now. We got to get the house clean and ready. And Terry likes to plan the menus, and she, she wants to know what's going to happen. And, and over the years, we've gotten ready for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of church members and college students and college families and, and dignitaries and, and famous pastors and missionaries. And, and each and every time, there, there's this little bit of a, whoo hoo they're coming. We better get ready. And always, what, what do you think they'll want to eat? I always say, they'll want to eat salmon. And she'll always say something else. And she, whatever she wants, that's what we could. And we'll start to make a list. All right. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's mop this. Let's clean this. Let's take care of this. Let's, let's, uh, let's lock the dog up outside. Whatever. When you've got someone special coming, you get ready. We have someone special coming. You don't get ready for him by just watching every trashy TV show. You don't get ready for him by acting like he's not coming. If you have this hope in you, now I want you to see this. It says, if you have this hope in you, every man that hath this hope in him, what does those next two words say? Purify himself. Ceremonial, ceremonially, this word is pictured in the Levitical cleansing as they would perhaps come and, and, and come to the laver many times throughout the process of making a sacrifice. They would purify or cleanse themselves. And I ponder this phrase, purify themselves. I don't look a lot at social media, believe it or not. I, have, I mean, I get highlights, believe me, but remember years ago seeing some younger men in the ministry and they were quoting certain authors who were sometimes heretical, sometimes borderline heretical, who literally were saying things like, because you're in the acceptance of the Lord, you don't need to obey all of the Bible. That's a rough translation, but that's the essence of some of the quotes I saw. I remember showing some to Dr. Rasmussen. It seems that there are those who so glory in the sanctification of the believer at the moment of salvation and then the fact that we're seated in the heavenlies that they somewhere along the line reject the concept of getting ready. And you can see it in their lives. I'm not be, being a proponent of pharisaicalism or acting as though I'm more ready, you know. I'm better. That's not the point of this. I'm just saying, and I've been preaching for some time now, what do you do with these two words? Purifieth himself. Someone like, I'm already pure. I've been washed in the blood. Yes. No question about that. But what do you do with James 4, 8? Cleanse your hands. Purify your heart. What do you do with that? That's just what Wesley and Whitfield and those guys, they were all kind of, you know. What about 1 Timothy 5.22? Keep thyself 
pure. Some of you theologians, are these not honest questions? What, what do you do with purify himself? True, only the blood of Christ can cleanse us from the stain and guilt of sin. But I believe scripturally that we have a part to play in purifying ourselves from the power of that sin. Let me say this again. Only the blood of Christ can purify you from the stain of sin. Can I get an amen? amen. But we have a part to play in purifying ourselves from the power of that same sin. 1 Peter 1.22 Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. In fact, would you turn there? This is the last verse. We're going to be done. So I want you to capture this because we've got to be ready for when Jesus comes. And I know you're interested in this. I know you're interested in when he comes. I know you want to be ready when he comes. You don't want to be sitting there with macaroni and cheese like a dumb 21-year-old newlywed. First Peter 1 Peter 1.22 Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. We see here that there is a sanctification, a purification. It, it is an ongoing uh, process. It is a once in a lifetime process. It is both. And we see how the purification happens when you're saved. And we see how it happens after you're saved. And notice the key phrase in 1 Peter 1.22. It is the phrase, obeying the truth through the Spirit. Look it. I'm not going to make a list for you to tell you how to get ready. Now, pastors have tried that for ages, and I don't apologize for having some leadership requirements for teachers and choir members and so forth. We have somewhat of a list. You'll see it next Sunday night. There's no way you could make a list of how to not be defiled in this world. You, they're making up new sins every day. I mean, I had to meet with a committee this afternoon to work on rewriting our church constitution. You'll get, a, you'll get a, a version of that probably a month from now. And we say, why are we changing the, the, the doctrinal statement of the church? Because now it's not enough to say man and woman. Now you have to say biological man and woman. It's just changing. So I'm not going to spend the next hour saying, now let me tell you how to purify yourself. Watch these two channels. You can watch Little House on the Prairie, Maybe I will make a list. This would be fun. <laughs> you will not watch the cooking channel. <laughs> oh, <laughs> come on. Don't get me started on the cooking channel. <laughs> I don't apologize for giving the college kids rules. They're in an institution of learning. You've you got to have order. Same with the Christian school. But I've never tried to pastor this church. You couldn't give enough thousands of rules. And even the college students, when they're out of here, I would give to you these two. Obey the Word and obey the Holy Spirit. Obey the Word and obey the Holy Spirit. Now, moms and dads, you can break that down for your 16-year-old. And you can help them to understand what you've learned. And the Bible says, children, obey your parents. I get, I get that there's realms. But I'm saying, if you're going to be ready for the coming of the Lord, then you must purify yourself. And how does, how does that happen? Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Amen. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not is sin. What's the truth? Well, the Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. It would take me volumes to try to guide you through. We used to preach against the movie theater. Hey, you got tablets and phones and good night. Can I just say to you, obey the truth. Amen. 
The Bible is very clear that God created male and female. In fact, there's even a verse that says, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And I know, because when I was a teenager and I was a rebellious punk, like some of you are rebellious punks, I used to say to my dad, well, how long is long? <laughs> you want me to tell you that one of the worst days of my life? This is before I was 21. This is when I was 13. I went to get a haircut. I came back to my dad at his office where he was a pastor in San Jose. Hey, Dad. Terrible words. I told you to get a haircut, boy. I did. Which one? <laughs> and then he said, now you go back to that barber and you tell him you want a man's haircut. <laughs> it's good for the military because that's where I could have gone. <laughs> See, in our family, the definition of how long is long is over the year. That was kind of how it was. Look at, if you just go to the Bible, you may not be exactly where someone else is, but you're going to get close every single time. I'm not going to stand up here and try to dictate. I can't keep up with all the styles. I asked my wife the other day, why do some girls tuck their shirt right in the front of their dress? What are they doing that? Did they forget to fix it before they came to church? <laughs> she said, honey, that's the style. Oh. Okay. You want to know what style is? It's these suspenders right here. That's style. You want to be fundamental? Come on. I can't keep up with all the styles. I can only direct you to the truth of the Word of God. You're not going to be ready when Jesus comes in the sense of conforming to his image and being sanctified progressively into the image of Christ if you are disobeying the truth. That's about all I can say in the time we have tonight. And you know which truth you're disobeying without me, without me preaching a list of 1,000 of them. You know, you know who's been angry. You know who's been cursing. You know who's robbing God. I don't know what you're doing. I can't list it all out. But the Holy Spirit, from time to time, if you're saved, He's going to ring a little alarm bell for you. And it's going to come from a sermon. It's going to come from devotions. It's going to come from something your mom taught you when you were five. You're going to remember if you're in the Word. Yes, sir. How do you purify yourself? By obeying the truth. There's a realized love. Behold. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed. There's a returning Lord. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. But there must be a ready church. Why do we go to Sunday morning and Sunday night? <laughs> One of our, there's a dear lady here tonight. She said, I came to church with my daughter today. I'm from out of town. And my daughter said, we're going tonight. Why do we go to church at night? to get ready. If something that I said tonight helped you to get ready to see him face to face, this was time well spent. And I, I know there's probably some good things on television, but most of the time, television watching's not getting you ready. Come on. It's just not going to get you ready. Be thankful we had this time. And let's be a ready church yes, sir. ready for him to come. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for this time in your word tonight. Thank you for loving us. Thank you that one day we'll be like you. And Lord, we do want to be ready. If there's someone here tonight that's not saved, I pray that they would be saved and washed in your blood, ready for your return, forgiven. But those, Lord, that are saved, help us to purify ourselves. Help us not to fall into this crazy accommodating theology that would allow us to live whatever style we want. Help us to be purifying ourselves by obeying your word. And Lord, help us to be a ready church. Our heads are bowed tonight and our eyes are closed. I would just simply like to ask, is there someone tonight who would say, I am saved, but I've not really been motivated by that love and that hope like I should. I've just been doing it out of duty. And tonight, God spoke to me that he loved me so much 
that I should respond to that love with like-kinded love, that I should be constrained by his love. Pastor, I want my motives to be biblical motives. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand tonight if God spoke to you in the first part of the message? The love of Christ constraineth me. God bless you. And then the Bible speaks to the church to be ready, to be purified. And I wonder if there's someone here tonight and you say, you know, I've just been allowing sin and, and, and I've not been hearing the word and applying it. And pastor, I do believe that when I was saved, I was completely forgiven. I was sanctified. But I do believe the Bible says over and over and over again that I'm to be preparing myself. And God convicted me about that. And I'm glad that that's in the word because I want to be ready. Pray for me that I'll obey the truth and be ready for his coming. Would you lift your hand tonight to God speak to you there? I want to, I want to obey his truth. I want to be ready at his coming. God bless you. Father, help us as we apply this truth and obey this truth to be a ready people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Two final things. If you are here tonight and you are not sure that Jesus is in your life, then the Bible says you are not ready for eternity. It's only when you receive Christ as your Savior that you're ready. We're going to sing a song. And if you're not ready for eternity, I want you to come and see one of the deacons or staff members up here. And then if you're saved, but you say, you know, I need to really focus on His coming and be ready. And God convicted me. There's some things I need to repent of. I, I need to obey the word in this area or that. Listen, why don't you just come and be honest with God tonight? Let's, let's hunger for revival at Lancaster Baptist. Let's be a ready church. It's not enough to have a building, a Kit City building. It's not enough to have an organized church. It's not enough uh, to have a big church. No, no. God wants a ready church. A ready church. And if you need to make ready by making a decision tonight to purify yourself, then I encourage you to do that as well. Right now as we sing, if you need Christ as Savior, if you need to be ready in some way, you come right now. We'll wait for you. Let God have His way in your life. Whoever has this hope in Him, let Him purify Himself. Get ready. Get ready. Mold me and make me after Thy will while I Yielded and still. Let's sing one more verse. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord. Wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow. Well, how many of you are glad that we have the hope that we're going to see Jesus someday? Amen. And uh, I pray that we'll live with that in mind this week. Just for a quick moment, if you would, find your seat there. And I just want to take a moment. Today, we're going to welcome some new members to our church very quickly here. And I'm so excited to do this. Last week, I taught a class briefly for many of them, and a few of them even joined this morning. And uh, this has been probably the most unusual year of all of our lives in some ways. And yet in the middle of it all, how many of you are thankful that God works in His mysterious ways and He does His wonderful work? And so tonight, we're going to take a moment. And Brother Gabe, I was trying to think, did we have, have we had a new members or is this the first one this year? First time. So this is kind of like our first time in a, in a year really here. And we haven't, we haven't grown numerically. I don't know a church in America uh, that's grown other than maybe somebody else's members coming for a while or something. It's not been a year where we've just seen hundreds of visitors every week, but there has been fruit at Lancaster Baptist Church, and that's to the glory of God. And I want you to meet some of these folks right now. So come, as I mention your name, and stand right up here. Brother Rule may help you. Uh, Brother Creighton and Jennifer Blake. If you'll come, and uh, Brother Daniel and Sarah Blim, if you'll come, just come right up here to the middle here. Bethany Brader, Mike and Karen Briggs, Jeremy and Elizabeth Chapin, Allison Crabb, George Crabb II, Sarah Crockett, Jose and Charlene Galan, Raymond Garcia, Tyler Gates, Brooke Goodman, Devin and Kristen Green were baptized this morning. And where are you guys? I watched them in the class last week. Listen so well. Young married couple. God bless you. Matthew and Susanna Helms. 
joined this morning, and we're really glad to have you guys here. Welcome. And Daniel uh, Hermesio baptized this morning. Ulysses Hermesio and Ulysses uh, Jr. were baptized this morning, and we want to welcome you guys. Come right on up here. Matthew and Susanna Helms, I mentioned them. Uh, Joseph, Joe and Dana Huss, if you'll make your way right up here. Appreciate the Huss family and glad they're here. Ron and Marilyn Lang, Brother and Mrs. Lang, it's been a joy to preach to you. They listen so well, and I appreciate that. And then, of course, we have Eric and Cecilia Lee, if you'll come. And uh, we have uh, uh, Gerber Lemus and Roberto Marrera and Alan and Elizabeth. Is it Mumi? Mumi, is, am, am I saying that right, or Mume? Mummy, all right, there's two, only one M, but I'll get it right uh, after a little while. And uh, we're so thankful that Alan and Elizabeth are here. Rebecca Perkins, uh, Jason Powell, uh, Philip Ruers, Aaron and, uh, Aaron and Vesna Sam. Did I say that right, Brother Rule? And then we have, do you know, or are you just faking it? You know, all right, just checking. All right. <laughs> We don't want to agree incorrectly right at the beginning of this. So Aaron and Vesna Sam, Michelle uh, Sparatio, uh, Mike and Carolyn uh, Tester, Rebecca Vincent, Robert Johnson. The second page here as well, Brother Rule. Okay, over on my left. These from our Spanish ministry? Praise the Lord. All right, from the Spanish ministry. Dulce Avila, Modesta Sandoval, Alvaro Sandoval, uh, Israel Galdamas, Gerardo Solis, uh, Eli, Elit Solis, Liliana Romero, Walter Lopez, Juan Ramos, uh, Ileana Figueroa, Alicia Avalos, Miguel Vasquez, and Donna Vasquez. Tonight, I would like to take a moment to welcome each and every one of you to the Lancaster Baptist Church. You came to this church at a year where some of our members might have thought, where's everybody at? And here you are. God brought you here. It's been a year of faith for you, no doubt, during COVID and to kind of get out and to find a church and then to stay in church and to be here on a Sunday night getting ready for the Lord's return. But you made it and you're here and we are so, so thankful that you are here. Uh, you have already a very special place in my heart as gifts from God during COVID. And, and we'll always remember, yep, I came during COVID. That's when I came. And we'll stand back and remember, all of us should remember, that in the last 12 months, it's been exactly 12 months since churches were told to stop. That in the last 12 months, when the world said stop, and when in many ways we had to lay aside from doing some of the things that we do, God still did what only God can do. And we've been out soul winning and visiting as we can. These folks have been kind to talk to us and we've masked and all these different things. But tonight, folks, I just want to say we're so glad you're here. Welcome to Lancaster Baptist. I want this to be a time of great growth for you spiritually. I want to challenge you to just jump in, be all in and grow and enjoy everything. The Easter services, the upcoming anniversaries, the leadership conferences, the men's times, the ladies times, just all of it. Just enjoy every minute of it. And I want you to meet what I really believe to be in my heart, the greatest church in all of the world. Right here in front of you are some of the greatest people that you will ever meet. People that know how to give and forgive and love and serve. Some of them have been here years and years being faithful and they're so glad that you're here as well they're not perfect we're not perfect uh, so forgive us if we miss something or something doesn't go just right but we want to do our best uh, to welcome you tonight and would you join me in welcoming these who have come to Lancaster Baptist in the last 12 months not dead. He is alive and he is working and we should desire to be a part of his work in this hour. 
and all of you are a wonderful blessing to us. Because of COVID, we're going to have a little bit of a smaller reception for you over in the choir room, and uh, we'll enjoy meeting some of you there. When things settle down just a little more, we'll do something maybe over at the Walther or something. But I want you to once again welcome these folks, and as they come back to your seat, just let them know how glad you are that they are here at Lancaster Baptist. Amen. Brother Rule, if you'll come, and I want you to tell us about the items out on the back table uh, that uh, we can use for our Easter outreach this week, and then lead us in a word of prayer. Before he comes, let me just say how much I love you, and I love getting ready with you for the coming of the Lord, and uh, I'm glad that we're able to have this time together tonight. Let's hear this final announcement. We'll have prayer and be on our way. Thank you, Pastor. We're three weeks away from celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are excited about Easter weekend, April 3rd and 4th. Our emphasis this weekend is friends and family. And so at all the Easter tables in the lobbies, there's the Easter invites, and we encourage you to get those, and everyone you come into contact with, give them an invite. And then there's a special invite postcard attached to a treat uh, on all the tables. We want you to take those, and then this week, a family member or a friend extending that invitation, people are not going to come if we don't invite them. So we want to make sure we're working to invite people for Easter weekend as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, and we trust the Lord to use it in a great way. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we sure love you, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather together tonight in your house and to hear your word from our pastor. And Lord, we're so grateful today for our pastor and his faithfulness to you and to your word, his love for us to preach it line by line, precept by precept, truth by truth. And I pray tonight as we consider the fact that you could come back at any moment. And Lord, I pray that we would be ready. And I pray tonight, whatever you have brought to mind that is not ready, would be made ready. That this week we would live ready for your return. I pray you use our church as salt and light, and wherever we go, that people would come to know you. Thank you for the new members you've brought to our church this year. May you use us as we band together for your honor and glory, and we'll praise and thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.